Um, I'm Nancy Lee, I'm a co-editor at the New Internationalist magazine. We're just across the road here on the Cali Road, but we focus on the whole world, running stories about human rights, equality, and environmental justice. And before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to provide some context to what we're talking about tonight, how to avoid climate breakdown. So as I was thinking about tonight's event, I remember the trip I made six years ago to a place called Mitradanga Village on the floodplains flood plains of South Central Bangladesh to do a magazine about how communities there were trying to adapt to the impacts of climate change. We arrived at sunset, it was a useful place. Floating gardens of turmeric, pumpkins on bamboo trellises, but the flood shelters and houses raised on stilts gave you a clue as to some of the challenges that they faced there. And I spoke to people about some of those problems, which were being exacerbated, of course, by climate change. And they told me that the growing seasons were shrinking from six to three, that unexpected cold snaps were ruining seedlings, and fish were dying as salt water leached into the rivers. And it was a remote place, but people knew Western pollution was to play. And Shoba Biswas, one of the women leaders there, said, and I quote, we're facing a lot of crises, uh, because of the people in the West. Our harvest is shrinking, but how can we expect Europeans to believe this? They don't cultivate rice and paddies. They don't raise cows. They live in big buildings surrounded by industry. How could they understand? And I think the point here is that something happened in 2018, and that was the year that this finally changed, and the Western public started to understand and really to wake up to the reality of climate breakdown. And it's interesting to see how much it's moved on from six years ago, but actually even from a year ago, and then actually even from four months ago. You know, the awareness and the debate and, and about what should be done uh, are moving very fast, faster than they are in a long time. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. One is a report by the UN climate science body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which came out last October. Uh, to recap, or in case it passed you by. It basically told us it's time to panic. Uh, global warming was happening way faster than we predicted. This report, I thought it should go through every house, the door of every house, be translated into every language, and be on sort of 24 hour news until everyone was aware of it. It's such a huge piece of, of so carefully um, collected information, verified by leading scientists all over the world. Um, anyway, it came, it went, at least it made the headlines, but this report was, was a game changer, what people called it. And it told us we're looking at hitting a 1.5 degree temperature rise over three industrial levels within the next 12 years, which is much sooner than anyone, it, anyone expected. In fact, we're at one degree already. And at that point, 90% of coral reefs would be gone. There'd be more intense heat waves and wildfire, wildfires, droughts, and floods would plague the planet, and several hundred more million people would face food insecurity. Past two degrees is going to be worse. Three degrees is basically apocalyptic. Coastal <coughs> cities and islands underwater and vast swathes of the world rendered uninhabitable by the heat. And on our current trajectory, it should be said, is we're, set, we're headed for three degrees more at least. Now, I won't dwell on this because the talk is about how to avoid this outcome and why it's still in our power to avoid it. But it's important to set the scene, I think, and recognise what's at stake. So I think it's also fair to say that we also know what won't work. Because we've known about global warming since 1850 in scientific terms, but it's been an accepted global policy issue since the Kyoto Agreement in the 1990s. And since then, sadly, it's been a story of basically of abject failure. More than half the carbon we've emitted into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels was emitted in the past 25 years. So we're speeding up the pace, not slowing down. And while countries like the UK with advanced economies may claim to have achieved a 40% cut in emissions since 1990, you hear that a lot, this actually drops to 11% when aviation and shipping and embedded emissions, that means the emissions that are in the things we use that were made elsewhere, are taken into account. So it's a story of way too many loopholes. And what that means now, after nearly 30 years of doing basically nothing, <clears throat> is that the choices left to us now are really quite dramatic. The drop in emissions, carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases, must be precipitous. And the good news is that we have the technology and we know how to do it, and it's, it's really quite simple, at least in terms of physics um, and chemistry. 
So on the one hand, we have to ramp up clean energy generation by renewable power. So although we get good statistics about renewable power, such as the UK ran a certain number of days with no coal-fired electricity at all. And these snippets of good news are to be celebrated. Overall, renewable energy just makes up 10% of our overall energy mix. It's important to keep sight of really how much we need to ramp that up. And connected to that, we, we're not just going to be able to replace what we use now with, with renewable sources. We're going to need um, to massively reduce energy we use in the industrialised industrial world, bearing in mind that 95% of people in this world have never even caught a plane. So let's be clear about who's using, using all the carbon. And we need to rapidly phase out coal, oil and gas from side from now. And all this on a scale and speed, even that bit is key, unprecedented in human history. So failing to do this means relying on unproven technologies to suck carbon out of the air later, which is basically way too risky when we know what's at stake. So that's the scope of our challenge. That's what we want to avoid. Can we avoid the worst of climate change? What do the scientists say? One of the authors of the IPCC report, Yuri Rogel, believes it to be extremely hard but not impossible with this precise Danish scientist definition of what's possible and not possible. And then the climate scientist, Kevin Anderson, describes it. He says it's a choice to fail and we have an outside chance of staying within uh, of avoiding the worst, if you like, of global warming. So it won't be easy, but it can be done. So, we've put together a brilliant panel this evening to explore the possible and shed light on some of these issues. And that was hopefully the most depressing thing you'll hear this evening, and from now on it's going to get better. So, um, to my right, on the far side, we have Andrew Sims, who it's fair to say has been chewing over this problem for the last three decades, and he did say I was allowed to say that. Um, and he's best known for books like Ecological Debt, Do Good Lives Have to Cost the Earth, and Counseling the Apocalypse, the New Path to Prosperity. He worked as policy director at the New Economics Foundation for 10 years, during which time he co-authored the Green New Deal policy paper back in 2007. And he now runs something called the Rapid Transition Alliance. Then we have, next to him, EJ, who's a 17-year-old engineering college student from Abingdon. And she's a member of Extinction Rebellion and has also been a key part of the school strikes movement who've been staging monthly walkouts since February in protest at government in inaction on climate change in Oxford and all over the world. And then finally we have King's North Bond who brings a completely different expertise to bear on tonight's question. He's worked as a, on the cell, sorry, he's worked as a like a, <laughs> he's worked as a cell side city equity analyst and strategist. Well done. Tons of cell side analyst and strategist for over 20 years, and he's now a new energy strategist at the think tank Carbon Tracker, where it's his role to communicate to investors and oil executives so he reaches parts that we may not reach in this room, the rest of us the dramatic implications of the low-carbon energy transition. So let's start with a round of applause for our panel. So my first question goes to EJ. I want to start with you because, along with Extinction Rebellion and other groups, the strikers have really opened up this policy space uh, for new energy and action on climate change. And I think you're a huge part of building this new consensus about why we need to act. And, and it's really quite a phenomenon, phenomenon for anyone who hasn't doesn't know about the school strikes, which went from a single Swedish school club, Greta Thunberg, in August, going on a demonstration by herself um, in protest. And, and what she said is there was no point, was the point in going to school if there wasn't going to be a sort of viable ecosystem for her to live in um, in the near future. And then just the, the inspiration of this one girl, by March, in the March strike, 1.4 million school children um, walked out of classes around the world, in countries all over the world, and it spread completely organically. So, I was wondering if you could give us an insider's view of how you went about um, getting the strikes off the ground in Oxford. Well, one of the things that a lot of people, especially people who are Generation X and above, don't realise is that young people are social. The time we spend on the internet isn't just spent by ourselves. We talk to each other. Uh, we 
give each other ideas, we learn from each other. So one of the ways we were able to spread the message of why the school strikes were important, why they were happening, and when they were happening, was through social media. So Greta Thunberg essentially rose to stardom because of what she'd done, and we were all inspired by her. So Anna Taylor and some other people founded the UK Student Climate Network. And what we've been doing is signing our strikes up to it. We started social media pages up, we got people to come along, we got people to like and share it. So it was young people who got this to happen. It wasn't just us. And do you want to talk a bit about your personal motivation to get involved? So growing up, I felt a bit powerless. I mean it's easy to understand, I guess, considering I can't vote yet. So I always thought, oh when I grow up, I'll be able to do something. I'll try and become an MP, I'll get my voice heard. But then people like Greta came about and said, no, we don't have to do that, we can do it now. And I was just like, yes, we're going to do this. So I ended up going to the February strike, which was arranged um, and organised by one of my friends. And I spoke at it, and it just gave me insight of what we can accomplish. There must have been around 2,000 young people there, possibly more, and it just inspired me. So I decided I was going to get involved, so I spoke, I spoke to my friend, and we, I joined up with UKSCN. So, yeah, I'm an activist now. <laughs> and so obviously the, the British government announced their uh, carbon neutral uh, net zero plan for 2050. Do you feel like just yesterday. Do you feel like you can take some credit for some of these recent policy changes? And what do you think it is about child strikers that gives you that certain power that others have? So in answer to the first part about whether or not we can claim any credit for it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> in answer to the second part, I think it was quite jarring for a lot of people when they saw on the news that young people were striking and they would have realised, wait, that's my child. Everyone knew someone who was out there striking, whether it was one of their children's best friends, whether or not it was their niece or their nephew or their own child. And one of the things about young people or kids is that we're innocent in all of this. Yeah, we've consumed carbon, but we've not had a say in anything. So for the adults to see us and see us essentially telling them off for what they've done, it must have been quite a bit of a shock. And that has just essentially launched this whole campaign. And I think that the government has been forced to listen to us because we're breaking the rules. Almost every movement throughout history that's done something has broken the rules. The civil rights movements in the states went against all the norms. You had uh, women refusing to take up the roles that were assigned to them by society. You had people of colour refusing to take on the roles that were assigned to them by society. The suffragette movement was women refusing to do what they were told. So we decided to join them. We won't do what we're told. We won't go to school because this is important. There's no point in us getting educated for a future we're not going to have. So to the government, I say, well done for getting it for 2050, but it's not good enough. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep striking. Until you meet other demands. Do you want to share your demands? <clears throat> so our major demands are lowering the voting age to 16. To be honest, I myself would lower it even further if I could, but you know we've got to start somewhere. Making sure that the government, that the UK goes carbon neutral by 2030. Listening to scientists, because the government likes to think they know everything, but when it comes to climate change. They may as well be a bunch of toddlers because they haven't been acting. Yeah, essentially, we just want them to listen to us because we are the ones who have the most to lose. People like to listen to the people in charge and they think, if that person knows what they're doing, I'm going to follow them. But the fact of the matter is, no one has any full idea of what's going to happen. We have an idea. We know it's probably going to be apocalyptic in size. But a lot of people in this room I'm going to have to deal with the consequences, but I am.
do. I'm going to turn to you now because uh, part of the research you've done, uh, the school strike is a pressure in governments act. And one of the things you've looked into is moments in history when governments and societies have managed to pull off massive scale uh, repurposing of energy, transformation of society in the face of an existential threat. So there's lots um, that you mentioned before. Can you choose you know, some of your favourites and tell us what lessons you think they hold from our current situation? I'm tempted to say, how long have you got? <laughs> um, and the, the, first, the, first, the first thing is kind of giving credit where it's due as well. If you want to look at an example of how something can be turned around so quickly, I think the youth strike for climate is an astonishing example of a grassroots social mobilisation. Um, and it's also, it's also rather a joyful one as well. I mean, apart from the fact, in terms of speed of change, that you went from a situation where Parliament hadn't discussed climate change, hadn't debated climate change for two years, and then when they did have a debate, 35 MPs turned up. And then within a few weeks, because of you strike for climate, we were able to pass in Parliament a declaration of, of climate emergency. It was incredible, the turnaround. I mean, it was astonishing. Um, and I really like the way the, 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 the demonstrations were personalised. My, my daughter, um, uh, who's 15, went along to one of them. She had a placard saying, we are nature defending itself. And um, the nature of nature defending itself was enough to um, certainly terrify the police. Because if you've been on a few demos over the years, I've been on one too. Um, I'd never seen such bewildered police in my life <laughs> as they stood around facing thousands of teenage girls not knowing what the hell to do. They just kind of took over. And the great thing is about how so many people seem to osmotically take to demonstrations as well. My daughter was there, they were in the middle of Parliament Square, and they um, initially were just going to be gathering for half an hour, and they it's boring, let's go and stop the traffic. So they stopped the traffic in front of the House of Commons, and they go, okay, right, I've done that, that's a bit boring, now let's go and stop the traffic outside Downing Street. So they went and did that, and, and I think it triggered, and also, because I know these things work together, but there was a way in which I think the moral validity of you strike for climate um, also gave a bit of a pass to Extinction Rebellion, who might have had a very different treatment from the police had we not already had a new strike for climate. So, like, massive. I um, also love the, you see the placards. I love the placards, they're so personalised. Like, who would have thought that, you know, one of, our, one of the great fears was one of the ones I saw in London was, you know, after, you know, in a, in a world of climate breakdown, there will be no peaky blinders. You know, it kind of touches people on almost every cultural level. Fascinating stuff, I like it. Anyway, Oxford, really great, but really odd to be talking about rapid transition in a city which is built on continuity and tradition. You know, you can almost feel a discussion of rapid change, a ruffling of Donald's feathers. Change? Change? What's that? Um, I used to live around this area about 25 years ago, actually. Um, I worked for Oxfam back in the, back, back in the day, um, at the time of the Earth Summit. And I noticed that even some of the cafes around here have had got the same paint job that they had 25 years ago. So, you know, I'm, I'm preaching about the possibility of change, and I realise it's not always obvious in Oxford. Um, but, to go to some of those examples, um, the one, there was something which happened recently, which um, you might have just completely overlooked, but I found fascinating. Because what it showed me was, out of the blue, how quickly a society can adapt to not having something which it might have taken for granted. If, you can, if I can take you back almost a decade to 2010, when in um, a faraway island up north, um, a volcano went off. Um, it was called something like <laughs> Thank you. Any other um, And overnight, because of the nature of a particular matter that fell into the jet stream, the, all the um, airways across Europe were brought to a standstill that cut off Europe from North America, Britain from Europe, etc., etc., etc. But what happened next was something of a revelation because the world did not come to a standstill. People car shared, flat shared, sofa served, used social media to help each other get around. Transport companies put on different um, additional sort of coach companies and train companies put on additional capacity. Um, supermarkets that were used to flying in luxury horticultural produce from um, around the world, from Asia and Africa, turned to local suppliers and replaced it. People, businessmen and businesswomen who would be flying to meetings turned to video conferencing. And uh, this went on for four days and the world did not come to an end. 
So something which was absolutely part of one of the arteries of the modern global economy was suddenly unavailable. And we found that we adapted within days to cope with that. Um, transport, there's plenty, I mean, given the sophistication that we have at our disposal now and the difficulty we seem to find in developing and improving our transport networks, think back to the middle of the 19th century, where in the space of a, a, between seven and eight years in Britain, we laid about four and a half thousand miles of railway track. A little bit later, towards the end of um, that century, in 1892, in a single weekend, the Great Western Railway, which is about 177 miles of track, was upgraded in a single weekend. They started work at dawn on Saturday morning, and they got the railway open and running at dawn on the Monday morning. Anyone who struggled with the East Coast Main Line and its kind of various upgrades over the years will understand what a feat that was. And that was without computers and all the rest of it. Um, then there's examples about how in response, of which in a sense we are today responding to a failed economic system in dealing with climate breakdown. But if you go back to the 1930s and an earlier failure of the financial system, the Great Wall Street crash, one of the responses there, the New Deal in America, where again, in a term which has been used as a judgment on the success of all new political administrations since the first hundred days of Roosevelt, in that time, he was able to re-regulate the financial system, create public works programs which led to the creation of many of the environmental uh, programs, the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps, housekeeping programs, rural relief programs, they created bank holidays, passed countless laws in a really short period of time. The consequence of which, one of the consequences of which, was one of the most rapid compressions of income inequality in um, America, which laid the foundations for one of the periods of its highest life um, satisfaction in the state since. In Britain, as another example, there's no time to go into it in great detail, but how in the face of what was an, another existential crisis of the Second World War in Britain, um, we were able to re-engineer our economy, change social norms, behave in a way using collective action which created the climate in which the National Health Service could be created within three years, in which we could deliver social housing building at the rate of 200,000 homes a year under both Labour and Tory administrations after the Second World War, a new social contract. We were able to do things at scale and with ambition. And if we look back and think, well, that was easy because we knew we had kind of Nazi Germany on the doorstep, it wasn't the case because for a lot of the period of time in the 1930s, there was a complete split in the establishment. There was a whole swathe of the establishment that wanted to see appeasement. So you had people like Keynes and indeed Winston Churchill agitating from within the um, establishment, within Whitehall, to find the resources, the wherewithal, and the principal will to create the Shadow Factory program and do all the things that were necessary, bring about the rationing program and the conservation resources that was necessary as part of that. You can leap forward to the post Cold War period. There's so many different examples here. I'm going to say right now, so I'm not going to get through all of these, I can see it was take everybody else's their time. Um, but if you do pop on to um, the initiative that we launched just at the end of last year, it's called Rapid Transition or Rapid Transition Alliance. There's lots of examples. Um, there are lots of historical and current examples of how from the local level to the macro level to the national level, big things, good things have happened quickly. Um, but just to throw a couple more in, at the, around the time of the Cold War, it's not been written about that much, but actually, when a lot of money came out of defence spending after the Cold War, there was, it wasn't in a very planned way, but tens of thousands of workers in the economy were retrained and found work in other parts of it. And one of the most dramatic, almost like a laboratory example of how a country can adapt to the rapid withdrawal of cheap fossil fuels. Um, Cuba lost access almost overnight to cheap Soviet oil and was faced potentially with starvation and the complete breakdown of its agriculture and transport systems, which were wholly dependent on cheap Soviet oil. And yet there, in a matter of months, there was a revolution at the local level that was nothing to do with the state and everything to do with neighborhoods and communities turning to essentially urban um, organic agriculture, urban Farming, city farming, and it saved people's lives, and it also led to a rapid improvement in the health of the population. You can leap forward um, to the financial crisis again, and perhaps I'll just kind of round up with that one for now, um, because there are so many more examples that we could talk about in terms of cultural changes which have been delivered in compressed periods of time. But something fascinating happened. I mean, apart from after, you know, there was a, a moment 
at the end of the 1990s when the checks and balances that were put in place essentially on banking uh, after the uh, going back to the 1930s the Wall Street crash the Glass-Steagall Act in America which had separated sort of casino type speculative banking from high street type sort of productive um, lending to small businesses and, and individuals um, that finally was kind of swept away at the end of the 90s and from that moment that peak of finance driven you know triumphal economic globalization to the point where it all fell apart in 2007. It was only about eight years. Um, but what happened then was really interesting. What happened in this country was really interesting because in 2006, Gordon Brown, Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, was boasting about how he had rejected the siren calls to re-regulate the city um, because the city was the powerhouse of Britain's economy and then the house fell down. And what happened? Within moments, the public sphere found the wherewithal to intervene and bail out the banking system. And something that we were told was quite impossible, i.e. finding very large amounts of money to invest in what was necessary to hold the economy together. They, you know, they kind of confused people because they didn't really want to be up, totally upfront about what they were doing. So they gave it a really complicated name. They called it quantitative easing. So you wouldn't really understand what they were doing. But you know, in the space of just a handful of years, hundreds of billions of pounds were created in order to bail out that system. Now, what happened to that money? I think it was very badly done because it tended to wash up in inflation in luxury asset prices. But had then we'd done what Mark Carney and even latterly after the event George Osborne admitted would have been possible, we had capitalized something like a green investment bank to invest in low carbon transition, similar amounts of money would have delivered a Green New Deal, which has now come back into discussion. Other things just to kind of um, reflect upon, because I think they haven't been included in the debate so much recently, but there's also a whole literature when we look at the, some of the behavioural changes that are going to be part of averting climate breakdown and producing better qualities of life, remember things we're talking about here are taking you know, pollution out of the air breathed by our children at the moment by changing transport systems. But behave, big public health behavioural challenges of the last few decades also show what's possible when there is concerted efforts, everything around changing attitudes to smoking, changing attitudes to drink driving, to dangerous driving as well, um, changing behavioural attitudes around the HIV AIDS epidemic, and even just recently, in much more accelerated fashion, we've seen in the last few years how quickly attitudes can change to things like single-use plastics, to things like everyday sexism, and even to things like what used to be in the Green Movement, the butt of everybody's jokes, veganism. You know, vegans, they're everywhere now. Greg's High Street, the lot. So I'm going to finish just now with, I'm just giving you a little quote from a fantastic woman writer. Um, I really encourage people to read this. She called Rebecca Sonnet. Because what we're about, I suppose, is our little tagline is evidence-based hope in a warming world. Um, we know we've got the agency, we know we've got the resources to deliver on what it will take to avert climate breakdown. It's the mobilisation now and the belief in the possibility of rapid change, which I think we need to grasp and hold on to. And hope is a very subtle thing. It's a fragile flower sometimes, but I love the way that Rebecca Solnit described hope. She said this about hope, and I'll finish with that. It, she said, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the, the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. It's an axe you break down doors with in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginalised. To hope is to give yourself to the future and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. Thank you. It's a really good question, and it's a really interesting political moment, and it is yeah, telling. What was the question? Take the mic. Just asking Andrew to respond to the new uh, carbon neutral by 2050 strategy that was brought out yesterday by the government, and how that compares to the bold policy making he's been referring to. Uh, and what I'd say is, you know, 
I don't want to be churlish and underestimate the fact that having that commitment is so much better than not having it. Um, and the speed with which we've got to that point, um, partly because of the way the issue has been pushed up the agenda, um, is, is, is great. And, but, and it's also interesting how people seem to kind of get, the point, get to the point of conversion to the issue when they know they're leaving the job. Um, but I'll brush over that momentarily. Um, there are lots of good things about merely having the commitment. And I think, interestingly, as effective, potentially, in terms of the day-to-day decision-making in government as having the commitment to net zero by 2050, is having declared a climate emergency. Because if we're in a climate emergency, it enables to turn around and question the logic of every policy decision if it does not align with that. You know, what the hell are we doing thinking of expanding Heathrow? What the hell are we doing giving tax breaks to North Sea oil and gas? Etc. Etc. That's a very powerful tool. Um, a few particularities about the, the, the way that the government have articulated their target. Well, some of you will be familiar from having heard the reports. Well, first of all, is that um, there is still a reliance and a dependence in a lot of the model on what are, what are called negative emissions technologies. That's kind of lots of different ways that they, you hope you're going to be able to bury carbon in the ground in the future, but we're not quite sure whether we can do it yet. Speculative technology. Loads of the models, loads of the major models, incorporate far too much speculative, wishful thinking around large-scale technological solutions around sequestering carbon. Another part is that there is explicitly included, or uh, allowed for within this target, uh, what I refer to as kind of carbon laundering or offsetting. Now, I don't know if there's any kind of um, offsetting techno nerds in the audience, but I, mean, I call it carbon laundering because it's not a like-for-like -like thing. It's scientifically un 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 um, unsound in the sense that you're swapping carbon which has been stored in a stable form as coal or oil um, for millennia for you know, potentially growing trees that in a warming world may survive, may die, may get cut down anyway, you never know. So I think the offsetting thing goes strictly against the advice of the official body advising on the target as well, the Climate Change Committee. Um, the time horizon, you know, we can argue over the time horizon too, so Extinction Rebellion have been talking about 2025. Um, the Centre for Alternative Technology um, and the Dead Zero Carbon Britain plan have been talking about 2030. You know, others have talked about 2040 or 2045, so 2050 is kind of... Um, it's, it's important to notice that the recommendation from the CCC on that was not based on the science, but what they thought was politically deliverable. It's a political time frame, not a scientific time frame. So that's a, an important thing. They've built in a review. There is some iffiness around aviation and shipping. They said that the government have said that it's broadly in the ambit, but it's not spelt out in the detail, so there's a bit of kind of slippage there. And um, you know, Norway set a target for 2030, Finland and Sweden, uh, Finland have set a target for 2035, Sweden 2045, so we can argue that. <coughs> There's, there are the policy contradictions I've mentioned that we, they want to kind of get away with everything about you know, giving tax breaks to um, fossil fuels and pushing fracking, expanding Heathrow at the same time. So there's not a continuity, there's not a coherence there. And we already know that we're missing the existing targets for the next two carbon budgets. So great having the declaration, the tools and the policies, the proactively positive ones, because they've wrecked the renewable sector in the last few years with their policy inconsistency, are not in place and need to be in place for it to be meaningless. And the worst thing would be to have a great target um, to be set up to fail, because then people won't, will, will lose faith in the, the whole business of kind of setting those kind of targets. So lots of work still to be done. I think looking at the media, around, one of the things that's most interesting about it is it's starting with conversations that I've never seen being had in the Telegraph and the Times and places like that about what decarbonisation would actually mean in people's homes about not having gas, about using hydrogen, and that's the first time I've really seen the practical details in the press, and that's the sort of thing. I mean, that at least it's it's broadened out the conversation in a way that just hasn't happened before. So at this point, I wanted to bring in Kingsmill. Um, we've talked about government, we've talked about popular, popular pressure, but what about money and the markets and the way the world works at the moment? So there are the industrialised economies like ours, we've already got rid of most of our coal, that's kind of the easy bit in a sense, that's the most polluting thing, you get rid of that then down to gas, which is harder to wean yourself off. But there are other parts of the world where coal-fired power stations are still being built, um, there's vast amounts of reserves of fossil fuels, which Carbon Tracker, where Kingsman works, have worked out that if we're to stay below uh, 1.5 degree 
uh, warming that over 80% of those known reserves cannot be burned. So it's all very well in you know, efficiency savings and wrapping up renewables, but if we keep burning fossil fuels, then it's, it's not going to help. So uh, one of the things that Carbon Tracker has done is they've talked about unburnable carbon and they've actually tried to add it up. But they also they also talk about stranded assets, and that's the idea that money in, invested in the fossil fuel sector will ultimately be lost. Um, and I think there was a piece today that was talking <coughs> on the carbon site about uh, Armageddon for the oil industry. So can you can you explain a little bit like, the financial thinking behind the, that the rise in the solar? Sure. So um, <coughs> if you add up all of the stuff that the listed companies have, then it's about five, as you say, it's about five times as much as we can burn. Um, so that stuff will have no value um, and needs to be written off by these companies and that will create a lot of destruction of value. That's what we call stranded assets. And it's, it's actually interesting, it's, it's no longer a theoretical idea. So if you look at the European electricity sector over the last um, uh, 10 years, they've already started closing down coal-fired power stations, gas-fired power stations and we had to write down 150 billion euros of assets already. So it's the process has started in, in fact. Um, shall I talk a little bit about why I'm fairly optimistic about this? Um, because it might seem strange for financial people like myself and financial markets to, to be interested in this in the shift. And the reason why is simply that something has changed very rapidly over the last three years. And that's the incredible falling costs of the alternative technologies. And that's what's new. So five or ten years ago, this was a moral debate. Now, actually, strangely enough, it's an economic debate. Um, renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuel-based energy. It's cheaper to build in India um, solar panels than to build coal-fired power stations. Sorry. Um, and it, it's ch cheaper in, in Vietnam to build wind turbines to build coal fired power stations today. In fact, my, one of my colleagues in Vietnam making this argument today with the government. Um, and, and this makes all the difference because when you have economics on your side, it's much, much easier to achieve a transition. Um, so you know, we've had the, the, the moral case very, very clearly laid out. Um, but I hate to say <laughs> financial markets don't care about morality, sadly. Um, but they do care an awful lot about losing money. So the, the argument now has, has, has flipped, and it's only flipped in the last, as I say, two or three years. The, the, uh, the economics is superb for this transition. And, and actually, what's really pushing people to change now is that they are scared of being left with useless, redundant, stranded assets stuck in the old system. So, so what you're beginning to see is a kind of rush for the exit. What we have to realize is that these are countries that export fossil fuels. Most countries don't export fossil fuels. Four out of five people live in countries that import fossil fuels. So actually for 80% of the world's population, they would benefit from not importing this stuff anymore. And, and this is the other reason why the governments of, of China and India and now Southeast Asia are beginning to change and radically shift their policies is because there's enormous geopolitical advantage to them to do that. Um, and again, that just creates a very, very different uh, set of drivers for, for the transition. So I'll stop there. And so um, by your calculations, uh, solar and wind will actually be cost competitive everywhere for new installation businesses uh, by 2020s. But coal-fired power stations are still being built or are still planned. And you were at the Catalyst of Climate Talks in December, talking, saying these things. Did you feel you were being listened to by states or influential people in you know, Poland, China, the US, or places that still seem very wedded to them, or Indonesia, or um, so, so, so again, the, the, the debate has changed even since Katowice. Um, China has cancelled 100 gigawatts of coal-fired power generation in the last 18 months. Um, India is starting to cancel its plans for coal-fired power generation. 
uh, we probably will see peak demand for coal in Chinese power next year, actually. Um, and, and the number of, you probably said there are still coal fired power stations being built, but the, the, the number now planned is 20 gigawatts, which is four times lower than it was three years ago. Um, and I'd be very surprised if in two years there's any net gain. That, that's a net loss because the other ones will close down. So it, it, you don't get transitions happening overnight for everything, but you've seen a very radical deceleration. And, and it's the, pr the problem is the reason they're still building this stuff is, is, is inertia. Um, so it's, I, I don't want to understate that the scale of the problem is incredibly difficult to stop inertia, which is one of the many reasons why um, the school strikes and, and extinction rebellions are incredibly important because you've got to, to raise the issue up the agenda. Um, and also you work with movements in this country. So yes, yeah, so we're working with movements specifically in, in, in Vietnam and Japan at the moment to, to, to try and change uh, thinking. And, and let's also be frank, there's a lot of corruption. It's much easier to bribe a minister to build a coal plant than to build, um, uh, put up 10,000 solar panels. Uh, so it, it's, it's not easy, and it, 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 it requires us to go out to the people and explain to them that they're losing money by building this stuff. Um, the, the, the other thing that we need to talk about is, um, and, and it's very relevant to, to, to Katowice, so you've got Poland, you mentioned Poland, China, and the US. Um, Poland and the US, Poland is a particularly interesting case because obviously they've got a lot of coal, um, and there's a lot of talk about justice. Uh, and in this being Oxford, we should think very, very hard about justice. But, but I think there's two aspects of justice. Um, and and one, ask, one question is, do we need to stop doing this? And, and really, there's no question, yes, we do. There's another question, separate question, how do we do it? How do we do it justly? And of course, it's really, really important to do it justly and to look after the um, the people who are currently extracting the coal and burning the coal and, and retool them, give them new jobs and save their communities, that's a how. But, but the why shouldn't be questioned, we have to do something. Um, and, and I think that's one of the arguments that Mick Robbins, you mentioned earlier, and, and, and I try to work on to explain that there's a very big difference between these two, the how and the why. Okay. And, um, and then just can you, you touched on this briefly, but this idea of the geopolitical map changing, one of the things I think you said is that we could see a shift, uh, sort of power shift to hot, sunny countries that are currently you know, much less powerful than other major fossil fuel producers. Could you got any more you can add to that? Is, is that uh, sure, line? sure. No, no, look, it, it, it's really fascinating that the global fossil fuel system that we operate in channels a lot of money to a very small number of people. It's by the few, for the few, in fact. Um, if you take World Bank data, 3% of global GDP ends up in, in fossil fuel rents, um, in, which is like three, obviously three pence in every pound you spend on everything, ends up in the hands of some really powerful, quite unpleasant people who don't use it for very nice things, should we say, put it politely. Um, and that's, one of the consequences of the current fossil fuel system, uh, you just wouldn't have that because renewables are obviously everywhere um, and everyone can access them. They can be deployed at every scale and every aspect of society. And what it means is that the global south, um, which doesn't necessarily have either the capital or the resources, uh, has suddenly got access to huge amounts of energy. Um, and, and it, it, it will radically reshape the global map. And then we, we wrote a report with the International Renewable Energy Agency arguing that it, it will remove power from the, from the petro states and it will transfer power and influence back to um, more hot countries, so places like Thailand or Indonesia or, or, or India. Um, and, and that can only be just, actually. So before we open up for questions, I'm just going to put a few questions uh, to the panel. So one of the things um, that has come up quite a lot is that we're in this special moment. It feels like there's momentum. It feels like we can make change. And it does feel like public concern has never been so high, at least not for a long time. 
But I often find that if you step outside your bubble of interested people and the people who are worried about these things and, and want to change things, you could quite easily realise how far you have to go, like when I tried to advertise this event in my son's school, which didn't go down very well. Um, so you suddenly realise that people find it confrontational, that they're not ready to hear it, that they think you want to make trouble. So you know that that's still that, those reactions are still there. So I wondered if, um, and I'm going to call on one of the audience here from Climate Outreach because they work a lot on this topic of communications. How should we be talking about climate change uh, with people who don't already think like us in a way that gets them on board? And, and there's a second question I think, which is. How much public support do we actually need in order to make change happen? Do we need everybody to be involved? Or I think it's Extinction Rebellion and others who are saying you actually just need 3% and then you're away. So, uh, Kingsmill, how do you talk to climate change, about climate change to all executives? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> to all executives, the argument's pretty simple actually. You just yeah. say, um, if you keep on going the way you're going, then you will end up being sacked because you will be taking your company, um, you'll, be, you'll be copying what the European electricity sector did and the global coal sector did um, and, and the car sector until two or three years ago and just sticking with a failed dying technology and you're gonna be out of job. So that's very pertinent for them. Um, so we don't, we don't bother with the moral argument, we don't bother talking to them about the future of the planet, um, or the millions that are dying, they don't really care about this stuff, but they do care about their own jobs. Um, so you've got to be very, very specific. And, and we, we just are making the argument that if they keep on investing in expensive, uh, damaging, destructive assets, then uh, as alternatives become cheaper and governments start taxing these assets, they will, um, they're, they're, they're throwing away money. And, and people are listening, and it's not, if you look at the, sorry to be technical, but if you look at um, the stock market at the moment, in, in the, the S&P, the, the oil and gas sector is the lowest share it's ever been. Um, and investors I talk to are forcing these companies to run for cash. They're getting the money back from the oil sector to reinvest it in, in new areas. And that's precisely what, what needs to happen for this transition to work. And how do you talk to kids in Abingdon about climate change? Are they interested? Well, one of, the, one of the things that I've had a lot of trouble with is apathy. So one of the things that people might not realise about my generation is that a lot of people do know what's going to happen, and I think a lot of people are quite resigned to it. So you've got some people who just don't know. We do make the mistake of thinking that everyone knows the facts and that we just have to get them motivated, when actually there's a lot of people who don't know. But then the issue is with the people who do know, there's a lot who don't care. So I've had a lot of trouble getting people motivated and getting people out there. But there are some people who are motivated and we just have to get to them. That's why the internet has been so useful because we've been able to get people from uh, all of the state secondary schools coming to the strikes and getting involved, people from the college, people from the schools in Oxford as well, so we've got people who are motivated. But uh, it's reaching out to uh, <coughs> older people that can be relatively hard. So one of the things I like to do, uh, I did it when I was in London with Extinction Rebellion, is I carried around a sign that says, I know you hate young people, but please stop trying to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's because from this reaction right here, people notice it and then people think. So most people have looked at the sign and either smirked it or given a little laugh, but you know that it's starting to get the message into them, it's starting to sink in. So the fact that we are out there and we are making ourselves big and the, the, it's 3.5%, if 3.5% of the population gets mobilised, gets out there and shows everyone what we can do, then the world has to notice, the government has to notice, and they have to legislate. Because we've worked out that in every major movement, it's taken 3.5% of the population, and then you're gone. So, what I say when it comes to outreach and getting people involved is that it starts with all of us. So, I've got people involved with I know. Everyone here, I, I say get people involved. We could have had a room twice as full as this if everyone had shared this, if everyone had got this message out. 
So I leave it to everyone in this room, as well as everyone in the world who cares. We can get our message out. We just have to. We just have to try. And did you want to add to that? Um, well, uh, I suppose uh, uh, only to say that clearly um, my, my followers on Twitter and Facebook were not sufficient. Right? <laughs> or I didn't put it to them in, or uh, well, they're all in London, maybe. Um, I mean, the things I'd add, I suppose, are that in making the case for action, um, I think looking, taking a kind of a, a long view of how the environmental movement has tried to communicate itself. We're in a really nice moment now. Because all the stuff that you would want to do to take action to prevent climate breakdown is stuff that's going to make life better anyway. I mean, in London, the rough rule of thumb at the moment from the, the City Hall is it's about 10,000 people die prematurely in London alone because of poor air quality. That's almost entirely to do with vehicle exhaust and emissions from cars, particulate matter. So get the cars off the road, get a decent, affordable mass transit system, public transport system, you clear the air, you protect the health of your child, and anyone who's had an asthmatic child will know how desperate that is. And what would you not do to kind of improve things there? Food quality, again, uh, and health. The shift to a, a, a less meat-centric diet. Um, the quality of life on our streets, having less cluttered with cars, less dangerous as well. Um, fuel poverty, an issue that still bedevils us. You know, 26 million homes in Britain to retrofit to make them more energy efficient so that you've got warm homes in winter and cool homes in summer. Tackle fuel poverty at the same time. Create hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs in the same process in every constituency where the jobs are needed in a way where the economic benefits of investing in that are quite sticky and stay locally and recirculate too. Safe homes for pensions, investing in renewables. The nature of renewable technologies, whether it's solar panels or wind arrays, are absolutely perfect for the maturation of pension funds. And do you know what? Since the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, the other thing about payback on renewables, it, you know, it, it may not be stratospheric, but it's really bloody safe and reliable. So safe homes for your pensions and green jobs and millions of green jobs, green collar jobs coming you know, at you from every... So, so, so why wouldn't you do stuff like that to make your homes, your neighbourhoods, your children's health, your job prospects, your savings, etc., to enhance all of them and at the same time do what you would do anyway, first and foremost, all the low-hanging fruit to take action on reducing emissions? So, yes, it turns out I did have something to add. Sorry. <laughs> And um, Climate Action ta uh, Outreach, Tara, did you want to add anything about, I know you've done research that talks about you know, ways to frame it in ways that doesn't get people's backs up. Did you want to add anything about that? Yeah, I'll well, quickly stand up and add yeah. something. Yeah, so can um, you Tara? Can you? everyone hear me? Yeah. 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 No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Hazel, for letting me comment. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my name is Tara, and I work for Climate Outreach directly across the road in ethical property. Um, and at Climate Outreach, we try and help people engage wider audiences on climate change. And we do that by using a values-based approach. Um, and so our panel today is a really great example of what it means to understand people's values. Because there's a lot of different people out there that have very different values, which means that climate change resonates with them very differently. But traditionally, climate change has been communicated in a very left-wing, environmental, traditional way that hasn't worked for 99% of the global population. So at Climate Outreach, what we're trying to do is actually understand all the different values of people, understand all the different values of people who may be working as fund managers in the City of London, understand young people, understand people who have been here since the 60s fighting for a rapid transformation and try and find a, a, a meta-narrative that invites more than just the traditional left-wing person into the conversation because, you know, you could send the IPCC report to every single person's house but what do you do if they don't feel empowered to actually read it and take action on it? So we're helping them find their voice in order to take action on that. So hopefully that answers that. <laughs> yeah, I was specifically thinking of the research that you've done about the sorts of words that you use that like you talk in terms of 
flood and fire, and he used quite terms, things that people, people can relate to in terms of threats to their own family as opposed to the moral case for why you should be doing it anyway. There's various things that come out, you've got the different materials if you're interested in speaking to that intractable member of your family who, who doesn't see eye to eye with your issue. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then going to open it up. I think um, I've kind of touched on the green new deal a little bit. One of the things I wanted to ask is, in the last months I've seen an explosion of climate action. I think Extinction Rebellion just signed up its 100,000th member today. Um, We had Greenpeace activists who occupied an oil rig on the North Sea on Sunday. BP or not BP who um, attack art sponsorship by the fossil fuel industry disrupted the um, National Portrait Gallery uh, on Monday, I think it was. Like, it's just, it's like relentless, it's amazing. The, the, the groups that have uh, existed for many years are, are kind of are fired up, they're working hard and evident the whole time. Best, and is there anyone here who works on divestment in Oxford out of interest? Oh, great. Because I know you had a victory uh, just was it last week or you? This is college saying they were going to divest from fossil fuels, some fossil fuels, the worst kind of thing. But so all, the, all this uh, change, and, and I suppose my question is, how can we sustain this? You know, what's going to be the next steps for some of these movements? Kingsmill, you've talked about um, empowering civil society in South Korea, Japan, other countries, to, so they've got the information they need to mobilise. Um, EJ, if you've got ideas as well for things that parents and others can do to help sustain momentum now that media interest may be waning on the school strikes. So one of the things that a lot of people wouldn't think of when it comes to a movement um, like the school strikes is that since the majority of the members are young people, people under the age of 18, there's a lot that we can't do. So we've had issues with certain groups showing up to protests um, that we have asked not to come, but they come anyway. So one of the best things... Like, even adults have a problem with us. Yeah, yeah, even adults. But one of the things we would really like is if more parents or just trusted adults could sign up to become stewards at the strikes. Or if they see uh, something happening, just come and say, hey, what can we do to help? But the other big thing is money. Like, as we all know, money makes the world go around, unfortunately. Um, and we've had, uh, so we've been having to raise our own funds, but a lot of people either are in school full time, so can't work, or can only work Saturday jobs. So we have stuff like a GoFundMe. Um, basically, just ask what you can, what you can do. You can message our social medias. But one of the things that has been a bit vexing about some of the groups that have shown up is they've come along and essentially tried to co-opt our strike, tried to take over, tried to show their own message. But what we need you to do is listen to us. It's like, this is our movement and we will be heard. So one of the best things you can do is get in touch with parents for future. Uh, they have been uh, wonderful with helping with stuff like legal advice. They're helping to cut out uh, an open letter um, against some of the groups. Well, for some of the groups who have shown up. So just be the person that you would want someone to be if you were in our group. Just listen and act and use your vote. I can't vote, but the majority of the people out here can. So vote for parties that support green ideas. Um, go to hustings, ask questions. But I guess it kind of, what it comes down to is ask us what we want. I think, I mean, one of the interesting ones, of course, and you hear it every time, and you heard it in relation to the um, net zero by 2050 plan, one of the, the, the obstacles that people raise to the possibility or the viability of programs like this. Um, and um, the obvious answer to that, I've kind of alluded to it a little bit already, is that where the viability of a Green New Deal is concerned, and we can kind of argue over exactly what goes into a Green New Deal, but when we wrote the, uh, when we published the, the first one back in 2008, we had a very particular idea that it did involve financial reform and re-regulation and restructuring of some of the bank parts of banking as well. 
as the kind of investment in low carbon infrastructure, retrofit programs for homes and houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we did also look at you know, how you would pay for it. And I've already said that we could have paid for, um, we could have afforded you know, nearly the, the, the rough rule of thumb estimate that we put out at the time uh, of about 50 billion a year. We could have invested, it's equivalent to the amount of, roughly equivalent to the amount of QE that was um, um, frittered, um, frittered away. Um, since then, that you can pay for it through direct tax. You could, you could switch the massive subsidies that still go to fossil fuels, out of fossil fuels and into renewables. Um, and there's, um, I've got friends, um, Richard Murphy, who is also uh, one of the great tax justice experts, has been a member of the Green New Deal group since its inception, has looked at the issues of costing, so has the economist Simon Wren Lewis, and looking at you know areas where there are kind of uh, great tax incentives around in, in the pension world. And as a quid pro quo for some of those uh, pension fund tax relief initiatives, it, a certain you know, percentage of ISA funds and pension funds could go into low carbon transition. Um, I think the big message I have about that is that money really is not the problem. There is plenty of money out there to invest in this. It's a question of having a stable policy environment, the right incentives in place, and basically just getting on and doing it. And Simon Ren Lewis said a lovely little thing actually the other day. He said, no one in a hundred years time who suffers the catastrophic and irreversible impact of climate change is going to console themselves that at least they did not increase their national debt. <laughs> he said, humanity will not come to an end if we double the debt to GDP ratios, but it could if we fail to combat climate change. I thought said it rather nicely. Well, no, I, um, in terms of other stuff that we say to people to persuade them, I mean, the first point is this is a absolutely fabulous opportunity, right? These sectors are growing. Solar grew last year at twenty nine percent. Wind at thirteen. Um, electric vehicles are seventy percent. Um, electrolyzers are growing. This, the entire global energy system has to be rebuilt, reshaped, and reformed. And the opportunities, therefore, are absolutely fantastic. We're actually quite fortunate to be in a country which is slightly ahead of the curve. In some respects, not all respects, as you mentioned, but you know, we're doing stuff, and there's huge amounts of opportunity, huge amounts of jobs, fascinating things to be done. My son is here, he's going to get into this world. Um, you know, I recommend everyone to get into it. You're an engineer, what a wonderful time to be alive. So, I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. That's one thing we say to people. And then the other point I think we've got to talk about is, is and you mentioned, is pollution. You know, we have this bizarre situation where I mean, people are essentially pumping sewage into rivers and not paying for it. And that's what's happening if, if, if you're releasing pollutants into the air and, and driving diesel fans in the centre of Oxford, it's just, it's just pumping sewage into rivers. And, and that's completely reasonable to make people pay for that stuff um, and to stop it. Um, and, and I think we just need to make that argument as well. It's, it's really simple stuff. I know well, there's um, someone in the audience who has been working hard on the climate emergency side of things and, and trying to, A, get things declared and also um, hold uh, public officials to their promises. And there's a, the whole sort of climate emergency movement. It's really interesting. Catherine, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah. I'm absolutely on the spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she writes really good letters to her. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. Um, uh, I'll just say a few things about some of the stuff that um, I've been doing. So basically my job, uh, well I work for a charity, but my other job I see it is to hassle um, various officials at all levels of government. Um, I feel like I've been spend, spending the last sort of 15 years uselessly hassling my MP, who's not very interested. Um, but more recently I've started taking um, more local actions, and that has kind of felt a bit more rewarding. So I've recently joined our parish council, where I propose we um, declare a climate emergency, and uh, more specifically that we really start incorporating some of that action into our planning decisions. Uh, we've got 17 new houses being built in our village, and I just don't understand why they've not got solar panels on, for example. Um, the uh, local government uh, moves that we've had recently, I feel like there's real shifts there. So we've uh, previously in South Oxford District Council, we had 33 out of 36 of the councillors were conservative and really resistant to um, reconsidering sustainable measures. 
But in the recent local elections, we've now got 12 Greens and 10 in the Dems. So I really feel like it's the ones of 10 to blow through local government. Um, and then last week, I was at the Oxford County Council Pensions Committee, and um, they made a huge move forward to divest their pensions fund, which is really exciting. It's not completely finalised yet, but they were really, really talking positively about that. Um, and so I feel like actually, having felt very, very um, unempowered to the things that I've done, trying to make some big changes at the central government level, and being basically uh, told to um, pay off by my own key. I feel like the things that I'm doing locally are actually really, really making a difference. So I really encourage everyone to get involved in local politics, and I feel like that is where the big changes can happen. After the events in April, which you will all have seen, we're, we're at a stage where we need to be kind of building the movement um, because what we're trying to do is one of the main um, ways that we try to win this is by civil disobedience, and for that, and we mean mainly mass civil disobedience. So we need lots of numbers basically, and we're trying to do that as best we can. And there will be more mass action, I think, probably in September. So in the meantime, we have to try and keep this in people's view so that people don't forget about it, and, and that means us engaging people have said about local issues i think that's really good a really good way to go so for instance the expressway the oxford to cambridge expressway that's one of those cases which makes absolutely no sense in terms of if we if we're serious about reducing carbon emissions um, and the divestment issue um, people already said about the pensions committee and there's other divestment opportunities so the next within the next thing that we're probably going to do is um is an, an, uh, the Ensenia, the, um, the university procession and awarding of honorary degrees. We're going to have an alternative one um, and award some honorary degrees to people who really, really deserve it, like maybe Greta Thunberg. And, um, and we're also going to have another action, I think, outside Barclays in Corn Market, because Barclays is one of the banks that invests, invests masses in, in fossil fuels. Um, and I think that people have already said about, about hope, I think that's really important. Um, and I think that hope often comes through action. So the more people we can get to become involved and to actually take action, the more we will make it possible that, that there will be this massive change that we need to have. Um, and if anybody would like to be on our email list, there's uh, a sign up sheet at the back. Sorry, could you just introduce yourself? And say oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mary Gill. I'm, I'm just a member of Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, Thank you event on the 26th of... 26th of June is the yeah. end senior. So yeah. you've got to turn up and... Well, I, I think the thing to do is to, to look up on our um, Facebook page yeah. or get onto the email list and then you'll know. I don't know the details of that, although I'm not organising that. Other people are organising okay, it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and you. then, and then the, the Barclays thing is probably the 13th of July, but that date's not even definitely fixed. Right, thank yeah. you. So at this point, we wanted to open up for questions. Um, so if you want to say who you are, and if there are things you're involved with in Oxford, we'd quite like to hear about them. So it's not like one of those normal meetings where you say questions only. We're interested to hear um, what you're doing to avoid plant breakdown and to work with the community. So uh, people just put their hands up and say who the question's for. First, uh, I'm down the plan. I'm a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, $29,000. And I'm trying desperately to get them to declare a climate emergency. <coughs> so it might frame and inform what your land use town planners are doing. They're not keen. Um, I don't understand why not, but that is the trap My question though is for Emma. Are you um, 16, 17 year olds striking for a worse, more um, wretched and impoverished future? And are you striking against climate change? But is there any expectation that Andrew sort of answered our generations, or given our generations answer to this, oh, there are benefits 
But I wonder if the young people think of the benefits in the net zero carbon future. But there's another side to that, and that's the new international side. Do the developing world see there's benefits for a net zero carbon future? Will they want some of what we've had and supposedly benefit from? Yeah, just to know, although my first name is Emma, I don't really use it anymore for EJ, but you have to know that, so I'm not holding any grudges. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think when we've been talking a lot about hope today, so I'd say have, I, I'm betting that many people here will have heard the story of Pandora's box, about how it was a box that was given to humanity by one of the gods because he was mad at humanity, essentially. And it released a bunch of nasty stuff into the world. But one of the things it did also release was hope. So, my generation, we do have hope. And we want a future where we have, we run entirely on renewables. We don't want the old ways where it's, oh, maybe we can just, you know, skim off the side and, you know, have some of this as well. It's like, no, it's all or nothing. Because if we don't do the right thing, and if we don't go into it 100%, then we're probably going to die. Um, and before my old age I had. So yeah, we want a green future. That's what we want. We don't want the prosperity that older generations have had because look where it's got us. Like we're facing an extinction level event. So we do want to change things. Well, sir. I'm glad to answer the new internationalist question. That was actually one of my questions, but I thought it was about time I let the floor ask the question. I think it's one, one of the concerns and one of the critiques of the Green New Deal is that it, you can't have a smart city Barcelona full of electric cars um, and the global south being mined for lithium and cobalt and no improved standard of living. So that is a critique uh, that we're aware of and, and that I think is real. So I think the question is how do you have a Green New Deal that avoids a stat need for other rarer uh, metals, but also um, ensures global justice. And I think it's possible to do if you make the right transfer of resources and if things are shared out in the way they should be. So at the moment, the, I think uh, people, the gov uh, government signed up under the uh, Paris Agreements, or perhaps even earlier, um, to provide 100 billion per year to developing world nations, and I think Oxfam estimated it at um, 20 maximum in 2015-16, so it's a lot less is being transferred uh, to the rest of the world than needs to be if they're going to be able to make the same uh, sort of leap for. In terms of what people want, I mean, elites in certain societies are already um, living similar lifestyles um, to people in this country. Um, the people who say lived in the forest, preserve the forest, um, there was a woman who I spoke to uh, while I was working on the magazine that's really the inspiration for these talks in uh, the Western Ghats in India. And she talked about uh, a woman um, who she was working with, a uh, minority tribe from that part of um, India. And she was asked, they were going to build a big mega project, project on her land. And they, and they said, oh, you know, what would you like in return for the, this inland sea that they were going to sort of destroy by uh, building this thing? And she said, oh, I just want another sea. Can you bring me another one? And she wasn't interested in the, in the, in the false promises. She was interested in the, the way of life that she'd had before. Not that people don't want benefits, but if, they, if there is energy, say renewable energy, then they'd like to be the owners of it, for example. So they need to be brought into that process. It's not a question of develop like us or stay as you are. There need to be new pathways, and we need to enable that to happen. Um, interestingly, on the subject of nuclear, the two people I spoke to um, work on this magazine, one in India and one in South Africa, both working on climate issues. They both, their attitude to nuclear power was like, why, why would you do that when you have a clean alternative? And the South African woman lived next to the continent's only, <laughs> the continent's only nuclear power station. She's like, in, state, in the case of state collapse, you know, who's going to take care of that? All the power stations, nuclear power stations, are by the sea. Right, and the sea levels are rising. Similarly, in, this, in the Western Ghats, they were proposing nuclear power. They didn't want anything to do with it. They said, why would you do it when you could use clean energy? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
They said only science would come up with something like that. Hi, my name's Wendy. Um, I just had a quick question for King's Mail and also for the chap, I don't know your name, I'm afraid, that, that he was involved in divestment. Did you yeah. not sort of that right? I, um, I joined Extinction Rebellion back in April, and um, since then I've been trying to sort of feel my way about kind of what I should get involved with and what I shouldn't and where I could best put my kind of small amount of time. And um, I just wondered, uh, King's Mill, in the kind of bigger context of the way that you're working at a kind of national and international level, how important is it that we still do things like go and have a big street party outside Barclays in Corn Market at that very local level? Where do you see that kind of activism fitting in the kind of bigger scheme of things? I, I think the thing is, we sort of solved the technology issue, um, but there's a massive amount of inertia. And to solve the issue, you need as much pressure to be placed upon as many points as possible. So personally, I think it's really important to do this because that's what wakes people up. Otherwise, they just could just keep on going and doing what they do. So yeah, it's really important. C c can I just say on this other point, if I may, about um, we will be poorer. I don't think we will be poor, actually, because the, the sun gives the Earth as much energy in 10 minutes as all of the Earth's fossil fuels ever laid down. I mean, if we can tap the sun, which we now can, thanks to our fantastic engineers, including those in Oxford, we can actually create a much cleaner and a more prosperous future for everybody. So we won't necessarily be poor, actually. Uh, which is maybe good, maybe not. I think it's quite good personally. Um, but anyway, sorry, to answer your point, yeah, definitely, it's really important. Um, did, um, did you want to answer the divestment question? Did you have a question about the divestment? Did you say wedding? Did you say the question? No, 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 it was, it was the both. Oh, it was the both. Did you want to add to that? Well, I have another question, actually. <laughs> oh, I'm jumping. Uh, nothing, nothing, well, I'm not okay. jumping, I mean. Uh, no, I mean, there were two others, but go on. Okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I'm wondering. Um, we heard about the um, the use of um, yeah of, of uh, say getting cars out of cities and getting your uh, small particles uh, reduced and it's good for health. So gr green technology is great. Um, what I don't hear so much is that actually, in my opinion, we've lived above our means for the last time. We have uh, here in the West there's a massive inequality. Um, is it not time to think a bit about lifestyle changes? Why do we need wine from Australia, green beans from Egypt, uh, having crops every year in the planet period? I think Andrew would be the person to talk about it. It's a, it's a really good point. It's something which has been part of the debate since. Um, Herman Daly talked about, he gave a, I, I think it was a real example, not an apocryphal one, about um, how a certain type of biscuit that was manufactured in Newcastle was also manufactured in, in Germany and, 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 and the German ones were shipped to Britain and the British ones were shipped to Germany and there were these lorries and, um, and, and ships passing each other in the night doing kind of parallel trade thinking, well, what's the point of that? In fact, I was kind of inspired by that. We did, um, uh, when I was at the New Economics Foundation, we did a series of reports uh, about how we live beyond our means and how that kind of wasteful trading system facilitated it. And um, well, the one which stuck in my mind um, each year was that at the time that we did the work, Britain imported and exported 500 tonnes of gingerbread. Um, that was just kind of random examples. There were kind of similar ones for like toilet paper and all kinds of stuff. And that's because, I mean, this is nothing new to the people in this room, that in the system we have at the moment, we don't price the externalities. We don't price the impact that we pass on to, in terms of, you know, the social impacts of how the economy runs and the environmental impacts of how the economy runs. And um, uh, Schumacher, uh, and Schumacher, the, one of those sort of grandfathers of um, ecological uh, economics as well, had uh, a, a, a lovely idea, which was an unfortunate word, because it's one of those kind of clunky words, subsidiarity, the idea, not that you do everything locally, but you do everything at the most local, practicable level and scale. 
so that you know every neighbourhood might have its own bakery baking fresh bread every day, but not every neighbourhood is going to have a factory making trains. Um, and this idea of remodelling the economy in such, in such a way that the proximity principle, the most effective ecological and socially effective scale of economic activity, I think is one of the fundamental principles that we should be using to reimagine um, the economy, partly because it enables for a more human scale economy. It enables us to build the relationships that weave society together at the local level. And we did a lot of work about the impact of the supermarkets um, over the last decade as well because of the way that they function like extractive industries, sucking wealth and spending out of an area and dissolving the social glue that holds communities together as well. I think all these questions come into play as we start to reimagine how we can all thrive within planetary boundaries and do it in a more equitable fashion. So I'm really glad that you raised that. I think that is going to come back into the debate a lot. <laughs> Two questions for the person. One, two, three. Oh, sure. so, okay, yes. where are we going first? Around, around the there we are. Listen to the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one, two, three. I'll try and stay still. Uh, my name is Mel, uh, and I, I'm here this evening because I'm getting into wind, um, but not, not by eating uh, something bad. <laughs> and, and my wife is here because she'd like to get working in the renewable energy sector. Um, so we're here to learn, actually, but, uh, and very interesting. First, an observation, a um, lot of hope uh, from, from Andrew and Kingsmill and a lot of positive action from EJ. It, I just was thinking, Andrew, as you were talking, some of the examples you gave, it took a second world war for society to change, or it took Cuba to, you know, sort of run out of food. I'm, I'm wondering whether it's going to take you know, the temperatures have actually risen before society changed, which is sort of maybe not quite as optimistic. Um, but, and a question, really. <clears throat> um, so therefore, off the back of that, will this happen quickly enough? If you think about the fact that I think there's two big things in the world. Um, there's what I call increasingly egocentric democracy, on the one hand, i.e., as you see in this country, politicians not really in it for the country or for the environment, but more for themselves. And secondly, on Kingsmill's side, there's indeed rampant liberal capitalism, which on the one hand might be good, but just today an Indian company has got permission to build a coal mine in Australia, in Queensland. You know, so um, against those two big beasts that have good things and bad things about them, sort of democracy on the one hand and capitalism on the other, is this going to happen quickly enough unless there's a single global vehicle to integrate and, and collaborate and move quicker? That's my question. Should I say one thing else? That just before I turn over. Um, when I was interviewing, uh, I wasn't sure I was supposed to quote him actually, I was interviewing a scientist, and one of the things he thought might spark the changes needed were some calamity that, was, that came sooner than expected, like the collapse of pollinating insects, and perhaps usefully a tycoon, a typhoon even, um, on a certain beach in Brazil, or perhaps another one in a certain place in the US that might deal with a few problematic leaders in a clear way. So perhaps if you manage to combine those two impacts and uh, <laughs> survive intervention, that would speak in such. So I'd say in answer to your question that I honestly don't know if it's going to happen in time. It's like, like I've said that a lot of people from my generation have kind of resigned from what's going to happen. It doesn't mean we're not trying to stop it, but we have to have some level of acceptance because otherwise we're not going to be able to do anything. We're going to be panicking all the time. So I'd say if my generation were the ones in charge, probably would have already been fixed because we're the ones who are trying to do stuff. Like you can see just from the youth strikes, and, every, and people being mobilized, even people who can't go trying to show solidarity. So people do care. The issue of the current people in power. So if we can get them voted out in the next general election, uh, perhaps in the, next, uh, uh, in the next presidential election in the United States, if you vote in Americans, if you vote in someone who cares about climate change, uh, when, the, when Congress and the, and the, Sen and the Senate, uh, when the mayor votes again, if we can get this done as soon as possible, there's a chance. There's a good chance. But it's making sure that we all do all that we can 
do, and we all get our voices heard. So, in answer to your question, I honestly don't know. If we do anything right, if we do everything right, if we get our voices heard, if we get good people into positions of power, yes, we can do this. We will get it done. But if people keep being apathetic, and if people don't care, and if people don't vote in the right people, then no, we won't. It won't be done in time. I, I would completely agree that, that we simply don't know. But what we do know, as you say, is if we don't do anything, we can guarantee it's going to go pear-shaped uh, and then some. Um, it's in us, isn't it? Um, nothing is really, really set, actually. It's whatever agency we can create, claim, and exercise. Um, I mean, when you speak to, you mentioned Kevin Anderson, the climate scientist earlier. Um, he's a, a, a regular at the big climate conferences. And when you see him there, it's really interesting because he won't just talk to the heads of state and the heads of um, the different delegations. He talks to the cleaners, he talks to the catering staff because he understands something about complexity theory. And he understands that you never know what will be the consequence of your action. So it's worth trying everything, pulling every lever and pressing every button. In terms of your question about whether it takes um, takes well, I gave a couple of examples where there were reactions to major exogenous shocks. Um, what was interesting about the war example is that actually getting the mobilization before the war even began, when a lot of people thought there might not be a war and that there would be some kind of compact with Germany, um, took a lot of agitation uh, in order just to kind of mobilize resources. But I'd also come back and say things like, do you remember the Montreal Protocol? It, it took three years from the identification of the problem to the signing of an effective global deal. The science was presented, people understood the problem, and there was rapid action. There's things going on all the time at the moment which are not in response to that kind of um, uh, the particular fear of an extinction level of event, but are in response to an understanding of there being a problem. That the growth of car free days, for example, it's gone from uh, it was kind of launched about about the turn of the millennium. There's now about 2,000 cities globally that do car free days. The remunicipalisation of water systems which had um, been privatised and um, led to you know, water too expensive for local communities and all kinds of things kind of falling apart. That's something which is, there were, there were two in 2000 and there's 235 um, by 2015. Um, things like, there's kind of cultural self-medication happening as well. The first repair cafe in the repair cafe movement, which is a response to kind of disposable consumerism, was in Amsterdam in 2009. There's now about 1,700 of them um, just in the last eight years, the Transition Town movement launched itself in about 2007, um, hundreds of those. So there's all sorts of things which are happening in, in advance of the sky falling on our heads. Um, but it comes back to this point that um, things will happen and make them happen. And it's our agency and your agency that's going to make the difference. And I think we're seeing evidence of that, just from speaking to members of the audience as well. And did you have a question at the front, and then you had a question before, and then yes, thank see you. when we get to time-wise, we feel just... Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't solve. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to bring this up, because I'm in June, but never hear anything about Christmas. Am I right in thinking that Christmas is a really bad thing for the environment. <laughs> I once heard a statistic that 60% of all business is generated at Christmas. And I can well believe it. I'd like to ban Christmas. Um, people are born useless patterns that people don't want the frivolous or the packaging. I'd like to ban bonfire nights as well. So am I biking up the wrong tree? Why didn't anybody mention it? Because it could have be been called Kill George. <laughs> EJ wants to ask that question. Oh, thank you. Cheers. So I myself have a personal investment in wanting to ban Christmas because it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really bad luck, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Christmas does generate a lot of waste. Like just in the UK, we use enough wrapping paper to wrap around the world. I've forgotten how many times, but we can oh. get. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, so I'd what I'd say is there's not actually that much point in, in just pointless gift giving and as a society we need to make a cultural shift for what we do for Christmas. It's like I would rather, if my relatives uh, wanted to help me, I would rather they just 
uh, gave me a check so I could um, spend it on a PlayStation. Sp- well, I was going to say I was going to say a rental card, but um, not on HS2. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We consume too much, and Christmas is just an example of that. We need to change as a society. Oh, so, so they do want to ban Christmas. <laughs> well, maybe, let's not ban Christmas, but let's shift how we do it. Like, switch to using brown paper rather than wrapping paper, or just stop wrapping your gifts. Um, or just ask someone if they want a gift, and if not, either don't swap gifts, or if they're a, a younger person who, you know, you would give a gift to and they normally wouldn't give a gift back, give them cash instead. Just change the way you do things. Well, I'll give my your person cash because you don't. You know, it's the only thing you can give them, but you know, you've always spent it on something, you know, for of these, and, you know, so, but not going to stop giving it to them, but you can't, you can't dictate what you're going to buy, but yeah, I agree, yeah, I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. I'm just aware there's quite a few questions, so there's a woman just behind you who's been waiting. Oh, just don't, why not, is it part of the last There's the man here, too, or just behind you, just to the left, he's got a few Okay, thanks. My name's Anne, and I've been at Byron, I've been at for five years. <laughs> I must admit, I'm feeling a bit despondent recently, but uh, XR and new climate strikes have actually reinvigorated me, and I'm, I'm really grateful for all of you. In fact, I've joined XR, but I'm living in South Africa. And one of the questions I have relates to my experience there, as, as a number of people have touched on, there is this problem of the global south having enough resources. The global north has not been transferring what they uh, promised. So this question isn't mainly for Andrew, but for others. How do we? How do we convince, how do we pressurise the, the governments of the North to transfer the resources to the global south that they need? Because, as you know, there's tremendous poverty there. I mean, there's terrible air pollution in South Africa, but one can't envisage a system like an MOT to you know, ban old cars, okay, so limiting yeah. diesel, because it, it'll, it'll discriminate against the poorest. Yeah. Um, sorry, I have another question, <laughs> which, yeah. again, is mainly Andrew. Uh, I think my view, and a lot of people here, that the real source of the problem is the global capitalist system. And I know, Andrew, you, you did make reference to how we might do things differently. But do you have a, a sort of grand view of an alternative economic system that we could all be working towards, a sort of vision, a catchy vision that we can help people subscribe to? I mean, I know we could talk about, tell people about the details of how it all might work, but I think we need a sort of catchy vision and say to people, well, it doesn't have to be global capitalism, it could be X. Thank you. Yeah, let's call it X. Right? It's really <laughs> branding. Let's go with that. Um, so, on those two points, first of all, the issue about transfers is, is fundamental. Um, uh, in the 1990s, I worked on the Jubilee 2000 debt relief campaign, which some people here might, there's a church that's probably involved in it, actually. Most of the churches were. Um, and uh, I think, you know, if you've worked on any global economic development issues over the last kind of 30 or 40 years, the issue of transfers has been fundamental. Whether it's been a case of negotiating the Millennium Development Goals or the 0.7, you know, a percent G- G- GDP, um, GMP, can't remember if it's GMP or GDP, actually, one or the other, um, uh, in terms of in terms of aid. Aid is the wrong name for it. Aid sounds like charity. It should be transfers in honour of all the um, all, all the historical debts that we have. But at that time as well, it also struck me that there's um, there was a kind of an irony that as a uh, we were campaigning for the cancellation of sovereign debt, which we thought was kind of illegitimately accrued in the first place between the financial institutions and sometimes kind of like captive governments or elites which didn't, weren't really representing their people. That was one issue. Um, and it was what, what the reality actually at the time was, was the, a reverse transfer. You know, we were hoovering resources and capital back from the global, from the global south. Uh, the irony at the time struck me when I was uh, early days of being involved in the climate change issue was that if you just changed the, the accounting system and looked at physical resources, material resources, you'd see that our ecological debts vastly outweighed the financial debts of the South, sort of vice versa. And I think it's important that there's also there's kind of a, a, a literal, all kinds of transfers going on sort of South to North. So the logic, I think, that, um, that climate change presents us is that when you're trying to get everybody to live within planetary boundaries and within a smaller carbon budget, the first thing to say is that if you can put whatever kind of politics or ideology you might have to one side, it is a mathematical and physical impossibility 
to do that without more equally sharing resources. Now, there's everything else about historical responsibility, etc., which I think suggests, uh, you know, whether you take a kind of a moral or a self-interest argument, that we're not going to solve this without transfers at scale. And I think that is becoming kind of evident to people. Um, and that has to be a fundamental part of the argument. And the question about the kind of the economic vision, um, uh, well, I think you have to experiment with these things until you find stuff that, that sticks. Um, I'm not sure if there's ever going to be a single version for it. I mean, I've written about it in kind of various books and dozens of reports over the years. I mean, one example of trying to create traction for a new economic vision was precisely in the teeth of uh, the crisis in 2007, 2008, which wasn't just the financial crisis. If we think back to that time, the oil price was going through the roof as well. Um, and there were major climate related crop failures globally, which were pushing food prices through the roof. So the idea of the Green New Deal was a, a way to try and encapsulate in a comprehensible way what a package might look like to get us moving in the right direction. And actually, some of the UN bodies picked it up and said that this, it, there is a kind of a global Green New Deal that we can kind of take with and, and work with this as well and apply it in those different ways. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll kind of... Um, uh, Look at the books, look at the books. Actually, you, I'm going to ask you that. In about six weeks' time, we've got the first heterodox economics beginner's guide to economics coming out called yeah. Economics of Crash Course. There, there you go. You're getting your opportunity to do all that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, look, on, on South Africa, the, the disaster of South Africa has been the failure of the country's coal fired power station because they built it too slowly and too badly and too expensively. And it's really sunny, there's just been loads of solar. Um, so actually the technology, sorry, the transfer that we need to do in the West is expertise and capital. Um, and, and actually that's what the German government, for example, is now doing. They've got loads of projects to transfer down. Technology, and as Andrew mentioned, there's no shortage of capital. So another reason why I'm extremely optimistic about this stuff. Um, can I bring up one other point? I was hoping we could talk about the failure of capitalism and, um, whether or not it should be a capitalist system. Um, well, I'm not going to pine on that, but I have a very strong view there's been a massive regulatory failure. And what we do need for sure is to tax the externality of, of, of the pollution and make people pay for, as Dieter Hallam puts it, destroying the natural environment. Um, because the, the glory of taxation is it allocates scarce resources more effectively, as we all know, um, and I think a very large part of this is better regulation and much, much higher carbon tax. I mean, to give you the numbers, the average global carbon tax today is less than $2 a tonne, and the cost, the social cost of carbon, is about 50 and, and, and on top of that, or higher, yeah. um, and, and, and on top of that, you're killing at least 4 million people a year with the current system, so we, we need a dramatic, radical increase in tax, which incidentally, if you if you put in, if you put a tax on a starter tax of let's say twenty, as we did in the UK, you create an awful lot of change and only cost one percent of global GDP. So you can do it. it, it you don't actually need radical changes to the system. You just need to start uh, taxing the externality. Just going very quickly off that. I know I've got a few, I think we we'll probably have time for two more questions after this. But I would invite people to stay afterwards. We've got the space until nine and, and call the people who you want to speak to. But very quickly, in fact, I was speaking to someone called Yvette Abrahams, who's an activist, a climate activist, and she'd been going around the Shackwell and some of the places, 15% of South Africa without power. And she was helping to spread um, decentralised, solar powered um, grids for people. And she said, you know, if you provide the poor with something that makes their lives better, then they will fight for it and they will take ownership of it and they will use it themselves and then manage it themselves with very little influence. So that was her, she felt a positive. There were types of energy now that where ownership could sit with the people um, who needed the power and that was revolutionary and that was going to see a change happening. And the other thing I would recommend is uh, Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth if you haven't come across it. Right, we're going to take two more questions over here. There was a woman who had her hand up earlier, maybe she's put it down in despair. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the man just. I'm not doing despair. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Liz, and I'm helping, uh, attempting to resuscitate uh, the local low carbon group that's low carbon east of Oxford. You see people here from all over the place. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me about that, then I'll, I'll stay on after. But it's one of over 60 groups around the county, all part of the uh, Community Action Group Network. And so you've got people doing the repair cafes and powering down and connecting with the local carbon hub and doing amazing things in Oxfordshire. Um, so if you want, so it's really worth checking out the Community Action Group Network and finding the local group alongside the local politics that you were talking about and extension of and all the other possibilities. And sometimes I think it's a bit bewildering. What can I do? Um, where do I start? There are so many groups and organisations, and it is quite hard to know where to put your energy. I came across a great idea on Monday from Scylla Elworthy, who you may have heard of, who set up the Oxford Research Group. So she works in peace and, and uh, anti nuclear weapons works primarily. She said, OK, the first question is what is breaking your heart? And then the second question is what skills do you have? And you apply the answer to the second question, you apply the answer to the first question. And I'm finding that quite helpful this week, so I'll just throw that in. What's breaking your heart and what are you doing? Thanks, Rob. Is there a way for people to get there? You should just grab you afterwards. If yeah, the local army stops are just more. I won't run away. Okay, and so the band is behind you there in that question. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So, yeah, I'm, um, my name is Keith, uh, still in the bottom of my van. Uh, we've got a, a hairdressing business, we try to be as ethical and agree as possible, and we believe passionately in the business as we were playing in that area. Um, before I ask my question, I'm, just, I'm not a religious person, but I'd be interested to know how the Methodists have managed to keep this room, this church, so cold. If you put that out, then we might have an answer to some of the issues we talk about tonight. Anyway, the, the, the question um, is this. Uh, I think um, most of the discussion has been about how we reduce our impact, how we reduce our carbon emissions, both individually, society, industry, economics, and we've heard for me, surprisingly, some quite positive messages, particularly on um, rapid change and uh, economics and so on. However, <clears throat> um, whilst, and, and this has been a very uh, human centered discussion, I can't say that without an anthropogenic, um, so we're, we're producing, even though I think we might be at a tipping point where things get better, we're producing carbon and methane and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> The other half of the story, though, is the diminishing capacity of the world's ecosystems to absorb and store greenhouse gases. Now, we're seeing... Sorry, have you got a question? Yes, yeah, sorry, I could have asked that. So, the well, question is this. Um, <laughs> does the panel have any, any thoughts on how uh, the destruction of um, habitats and the rainforest that the, uh, the, uh, the oceans, the capacity of the world to actually absorb and store carbon might also become, uh, might be halted and improved. I think one answer to your question is that whatever solution we find to the climate crisis can't make any of those other crises worse. I can't exacerbate something that exacerbates biodiversity loss and solves climate change isn't a solution because it's just another crisis on your hands. So I think whatever solutions are found need to be ones that don't make other natural systems crash. If you are you talking about putting algae in the sea to help it absorb carbon? Are you thinking of that particular Well I'm not, I'm not I don't have any answers. I'm just yeah. thinking we we talked about it's like supply and demand. Mm. We've talked about I one think, side of it. Yeah. I just wanted to think if the panel had any thoughts on how that, let's say, for example, <coughs> the destruction of the Amazon rainforest has now been destroyed at a faster rate than ever before. This, this is a massive part of the solution if we can halt and possibly improve, improve that situation. So, do the panel have any thoughts on that? On that particular issue. Do you like anybody to respond to that? So, um, I think one of the things 
that we definitely need to do, I mean, this will just help mitigate it more than actually fixing it, is um, legis uh, legislating what companies can and cannot do, and, I don't know, forcing the impact in a way. 71% of climate change uh, emissions, are, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, are produced by 100 companies. So we keep saying what can we do as individuals, but everything we do on an individual level is great, like going, like going vegetarian, going vegan, taking part in meat-free Mondays, not using plastic straws. But when it comes down to it, what we really need to do is legislate um, the people in charge. And we'd like to think that the people in charge are governments, but at the moment it seems to be corporations. <coughs> so, so there are some ideas. There are some ideas. The, People like Bolsonaro, the current president of Brazil, uh, I'm not on our side when it comes to this. Like he's said, um, I'm not quoting this exactly, I'm paraphrasing, but he doesn't really care if the anti rainforest gets cut down. So what we need to do is just place sanctions, like pressure Brazil to put legislation, to put legislation in place to stop uh, the rainforest from being cut down. We need to be putting money into schemes to regrow parts of it that have already been cut down. Um, we need to, as a society, put down our meat consumption so that less cattle is being raised there, so there's less of a reason to cut the trees down. And everything we do to try and help the world and to help ourselves get rid of our carbon, we have to do together, and everything is linked. So I don't answer to that. We just need to get the people who know about all of it, and we need to ask them what to do, and then we need to force the governments of the world well, that might be a bit of a forceful word, but we need to get the government. Actually, no, we need to force the government to work out. Like their job is to, is to serve us, not to rule us. So, yeah, what we can do is act as a species, I guess. A um, quick response to that is. There is a very good, um, it's not perfect, it's getting better all the time, there's a very good measure of the thing that you're talking about, which is the ecological footprint, which gives us an idea of the degree to which we are overburdening various ecosystems, whether it's fisheries, forests, or, or whatever. And um, we worked with the Global Footprint Network um, um, a few years ago to come up with a, a way of imagining it as like if you got through the whole year, you were living within your environmental means. You were not, uh, you were not consuming and reducing waste at a rate that ecosystems and the biosphere could not absorb and regenerate. And since the 1970s, which was about the mid-1970s, was the last time when we actually lived within our um, ecological means. We've been eating earlier into the year when we get to the point where we're over-consuming and producing too much waste. This year, it's going to fall in the, for the earliest time that it ever has done. We'll be going into the ecological red, if you like, on July the 29th. And I think there's lots of things that we can do. These are well-trodden sort of campaign areas um, about um, protected areas, quantitative limits in terms of extraction, rights to communities who live with the ecological um, re resources. And there's a lot of evidence to say in Brazil that where you give rights to um, indigenous peoples, that is one of the best ways of ensuring their protection and preservation. But um, to link your question with the question earlier over here about, is there a kind of a neat little boiled down version uh, 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 for talking about how you would design the new economy? Um, I think there are three questions that you can ask of every proposal, policy, thing which is being built in the economy. And if you get the right answers, it's going to point them in the right direction. And if you get the wrong answers, we shouldn't be doing it. And those three questions, I think, are, if you do whatever it is said that is being, or being proposed, will it improve or worsen the distribution of economic benefits to people from that thing? Will it increase or lower your ecological footprint? And what's the third one? Will it raise or lower human well-being as a consequence? Because there is now, we've got decades worth of research about what does actually improve life satisfaction or reduce it. So is it, does it make your well-being better? Does it make the fair distribution of benefits from the economic activity better? And does it reduce your ecological footprint? If you can say yes to all of those three things, you've got a new economy. 
I'd love to carry on, but I think it's, we've overrun. We started 15 minutes late and we've overrun now um, by that extra sort of 50 minutes past that time. So I think we will have to wrap up. But um, I'm just going to recap four things that have stayed with me from the things that have been said tonight. And one is that um, the changes we need will make life better. Another is that we have morality and economics on our side. Another was if we look to history, we can see that it's in our power to make the changes we need. And to end on uh, EJ's point, they're listening because we're breaking the rules. So I think those are the four um, key messages to take away. And I hope that people have come away with a sense of um, what we call um, conditional optimism. So that's not blind optimism, it's seeing that we have the tools that are available to us that we can fix this, not that someone's going to do it for us. Um, before we break off, I will quickly say that if you've enjoyed tonight's talk, uh, the ideas you've heard here tonight and the sorts of things that our magazine, New Internationalist, is all about. Um, there are copies for sale of the private magazines at the back um, and other issues and free trial subscription forms on your seat if you want to try it out. Um, there's also feedback forms if you've got the energy left to fill in one of those and if you haven't got the heart the feedback forms, just put a comment on the post it notes. Uh, on the way out. We do have the venue until 9, tea and coffee snacks, feel free to stay and chat until then. Um, and we also have two more dates, and we're talking about someone who's at one more friends, we've got a date in uh, London coming up and also dates in Prue, which are listed on the posters if you have friends in those cities. Uh, and finally, we should say thank you to the Howie Road Methodist Church for hosting us. Uh, and big thank you to you all for coming, but the biggest thanks of all to our panel for giving us their time to speak to us. Thank you.